really always glad to be talking to a community college audience. I've been doing this quite a bit over the last uh, couple of years, in particular since the community college system has made the substantial commitment to equity and delivering some equity funding and asked to come in. But part of the reason why um, I am so enthusiastic about talking to a community college audience is that my family benefited dramatically uh, from community college. Uh, my dad, who was an undocumented immigrant who came to the country in the 1930s, uh, a very different era, he was able to uh, gain his citizenship uh, during World War II when he was given a choice between being deported or joining the U.S. Uh -huh. Army. Uh, quite a choice. And the story is true. He uh, literally couldn't figure out what to do, so he gave a penny to my cousin Carlitos who flipped it. And that's how the decision got made. Uh, <laughs> but after World War II, when he came back uh, and eventually we moved to California, um, he was trying to figure out how, and some of you probably experienced it, my, my family when I was growing up was poor. Uh, you know, the kind of poor where you open up the refrigerator door and you go and shut it again because there really wasn't anything interesting in there, like anything. Uh, but we went from being poor to being working class when my dad, who was a janitor, went to LA Trade Tech and learned about electricity and was able to become an air conditioner repairman. And the family then could move to a much more stable uh, level of income. So thank you, California Community Colleges. Yeah. Uh, you made a professor of me. Uh, so what I want to do here, spending a lot of time here, focusing in on their own students, and we will kind of come back to that in general Q&A. But what I wanted to do uh, with you is to spend some time talking about uh, 10 sort of key trends affecting LA County's future, uh, and actually in some ways California and America's future, and then we'll think through afterwards what the implications are for the work you're really specifically doing uh, in uh, West LA uh, College. Uh, so I, I, I want you to uh, take uh, an opportunity to think a little bit bigger about the big trends. I know when, for all of us, when we're involved in the difficult situations of young people's lives, uh, with the challenges and under-resourced systems like the community college, we keep our focus here, uh, and that makes sense. Uh, but I want to uh, urge you for the next four or so minutes to just kind of think about some of the bigger and broader uh, trends that are affecting California and LA County and then kind of how they filter down into uh, the community college system. So uh, the first set of trends uh, are sort of interesting and directly relevant to you, and they're the ones we'll probably spend the most time on. Uh, this is great now Now that I've had a jacket on that looked formal enough for <laughs> right now. Yes, I am a professor. Uh, <laughs> now I can just, uh, usually I just wear a t-shirt too. So. Uh, very Los Angeles. So what I want to do is to talk, talk about uh, the demographic trends that are uh, affecting us. And the sort of really key lesson to take away um, is that while everybody thinks of Los Angeles as being at the cutting edge of demographic change, we are because demographic change has almost stopped. So it's kind of an interesting thing to kind of keep in mind. So when people think about demographic change. What they're normally thinking about is sort of what's going on in the country and the fact that it's projected by the year 2043-2044 that the country will become, some people use the term majority minority. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me because uh, particularly as we move into that future, no, every group is a minority. So it's, it will be majority people of color. Uh, interestingly, uh, about 10 years before that, by about 2039, the majority of the workforce will be people of color. And I didn't say the majority of entrants into the workforce, the majority of the workforce 
and for the nation as a whole, by the end of this decade, the majority of young people under the age of 18 uh, will be uh, kids of color. So that's a lot of demographic change. Uh, and it's part of the reason why, of course, we got the results we did in the last uh, election. Uh, you know, there's that, uh, for those of you who are a little bit older, you'll remember that great uh, public enemy album, Fear of a Black Planet. Uh, you know, that election was kind of fear of a blackish, brownish America, right? So that demographic change has some of us pretty excited, uh, but it's got a lot of people in the nation very scared about what's going to happen. Um, and interestingly, I'd like to point this out, uh, the people in the United States that seem to be the most concerned, for example, about immigrants, don't have any, right? When you move to the Midwest, there's very few immigrants. When you move to the <coughs> South, it's just now coming up. The places that actually do have a lot of immigrants, uh, like Los Angeles, we're just like, wow, Korean taco trucks. That's great. Uh, so <laughs> there's uh, an interesting set of things about that, and it's reflected in the following thing. If you look at the demographic change projected for the United States between 2000 and 2050, in which it moves from being about 69% non-Hispanic white to being about 47% non-Hispanic white, that is basically the demographic change that California went through between 1980 and 2000. California was America fast forward. And Los Angeles was America on steroids. So if you look at LA County, it went, I mean, by 1980, it was 53% non-Hispanic white. By, you know, went to be full, uh, about 59% people of color by 1990. Pretty rapid change, etc. So big changes that happened in California and in Los Angeles County. But one of the things that you'll notice if you look at, for example, the demographic change that's projected for Los Angeles County is it's starting to dramatically slow down, right? So if you start looking from 2010 to 2050, yes, the, sh the share of the population that's Latino is going to grow, but not as much as it was before. The African-American population, pretty stable. The Asian Pacific Islander population, hardly moving at all. Uh, so why this demographic slowdown? A couple of things have gone on. First, just about every white person who was afraid of the demographic change has already moved out, right? <laughs> uh, so the folks who are left are sort of either more comfortable with it or it's just not an important issue for them. Second, what people forget is that immigration into the country has dramatically slowed, uh, which you would not think from listening to the discussions that occurred around the election, but as we know, uh, discussions around an election are generally fact-free. They were particularly fact-free this last uh, set of elections. Uh, but uh, the, sh the, uh, the flows of immigration to the country have stabilized. Uh, the flows from Asia now are outpacing flows from Latin America. And the migration from Mexico is actually net negative. There's more Mexicans returning to Mexico than coming into the United States right now. And that's probably likely to persist uh, because the fertility rates in Mexico have declined dramatically. And so the sort of population push factors have, they're not there as long as much as they were. The Mexican economy is actually, it's, it's not doing fantastically, but it's doing okay. And you know, you need a pretty collapsed economy for people to say, I want to leave my family, I want to leave my hometown, I want to leave everything I know to go someplace else because the economy is so collapsed. So when there's not as much population pressure, there's not as much uh, sort of economic pressure, uh, there's more Mexicans now returning to Mexico than coming to the United States. The joke I was put in there is that this means that if we build a wall, we're just penning Mexicans into the United States, um, which, which is probably not Trump's intention, but it would be a fact. Um, 
And in fact, that has been one of the things, one of the reasons why the undocumented population grew dramatically and has now stabilized and in fact fallen over the last couple of years is it became so hard to move back and forth between the United States that people, when they came in, just stayed. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, statistical models that's showing that if we had the sort of fluidity that we had um, in the 80s, we actually would have a lower level of undocumented people because people didn't really want to stay. But of course, once you stay, form a relationship, have children, you're not going anywhere. Um, so, uh, so what's fascinating is the big image people have is that we're continuing to change demographically. If you want to look at the California in the future, look around you. You're looking at it. It's not going to change that much more going forward. At least it's not going to change that much more at what you might call an aggregate level. It is going to change a lot more at a micro level, and that's about what I'm about to get into. Um, so one of the things that's going to change is that uh, a lot of our Latino and Asian populations are going to be a lot less foreign-born. So uh, the share of immigrants uh, in Los, the share of foreign-born in Los Angeles has actually been on the decline since 2000. And what's going on is that our foreign-born have been here for a long time, more children, the share that they constitute of the overall population is actually on the decline. That's starting to happen for California. It's still increasing in the rest of the United States. Now, what's going on? So if you look at uh, Los Angeles County, um, by the way, can you tell that I like graphs and data? Yes, oh good, she likes it. Okay, for those of you who don't like graphs and data, I will tell a story with each one, but believe me, these things are works of art, they're beauty. Uh, so, um, one of the things to notice, so, little thing that's a little screwed just because of the way the data is collected. The first bunch of data points are decades, um, and then from 2000 to 2005, and then it's annual from there on in. And that just has to do with the way the census has been collecting data. Um, but what you can see is that if you look at Los Angeles, the blue line, um, we saw a dramatic increase in the foreign born in Los Angeles between 1970 uh, in 1990 in particular, um, and whereas it was actually increasing very slowly in, in the United States as a whole. And in fact, if we uh, looked at, if we took California out of the United States, which feels like something we should do right now, uh, if you took California out from the rest of the United States, basically the share of foreign born in the rest of the United States between 1970 and 1990 was pretty much even. There were not immigrants. So what happened was that in the 70s and the 80s, uh, about a quarter, about half of the nation's immigrants came to California. About a quarter of the nation's immigrants came to Los Angeles County. So we had a gigantic immigrant shock demographically. It also led to the politics of Prop 187 in 1994, which was the proposition that sought to strip services, including education, from undocumented immigrants. Um, so. Uh, we experienced that shock. Uh, but since then, uh, we've stabilized. Uh, and uh, you can see that actually even for LA County, the percent foreign born has really uh, fallen. So what's that mean? Uh, for one thing, what it means is that California is the state with the most long settled immigrants. So while people mostly have an image of immigrants as people because the word immigrant and folks migration and you know movement, 82% of immigrants in California have been here for longer than a decade. That's a long time. And in fact, uh, it's also the case, and you'll see in a minute, that 62% of undocumented immigrants have been in California for more than 10 years, if they're undocumented. So what that means, and this, you have a lot of this, the, the children of those parents and some of the kids themselves are undocumented, but they're deeply rooted. Uh, if you've been in a place for longer than 10 years uh, and you've got children, etc., you'll see a little bit about this. We've taken to not calling people undocumented immigrants, but undocumented Californians. 
they're really deeply settled into the population. Um, so in Los Angeles County, people are foreign born, or about a third of the population, about half of the workforce. Nearly uh, over 60% of children have at least one immigrant parent. About 20% of children in Los Angeles County have one undocumented parent. At least one parent is undocumented. And I believe uh, Angel was mentioning something about this, or, or somewhat less. But if you look at, so when people look at undocumented immigrants, what they, they so again, this is kind of looking at the micro change, the change beneath the change. Uh, what we tend to think about when we think of an undocumented immigrant is someone who, uh, you know, is standing in front of Home Depot, uh, offering their services. They, we think of them as perhaps lightly attached uh, to the places where they live, having recently arrived. And if I was giving this talk to you 20, 25 years ago, and God knows why West LA did not invite me to do this 25 years ago. <laughs> Clearly, yeah, I'm a mistake on your part. Uh, but if you invited me 20 or 25 years ago, I would have said, you know, only a third of the undocumented have been here for more than 10 years. Most of them are men. You know, they're kind of attached lightly to the labor force. Now it's a much more settled population. So what it means is there's about 900,000 undocumented immigrants just in LA County. But living with them in the same household, family members who are U.S. citizens, about another 800,000. Living with them in the same household, family members who have lawful permanent resident status, another 250,000. By the way, there's also family members not living with them, right, who might care about them. Uh, but what that means is just living in the same household, uh, 900,000, 800,000, 250,000, add that up, you're about one, uh, you're about uh, uh, 2.1 million or so. Uh, that's, uh, a, that's about 20% of Los Angeles County either undocumented or affected in their household by the status question. That's a big number. That's a big number. And it's, uh, as I mentioned, undocumented Angelitos have been in the United States 62% for more than a decade. Um, and it's a kind of interesting data point, but it speaks to what's going on. So let me just tease it out. So this is a little too obscure for some of you, but not I forgot your first name. Shannon. Shannon, who uh, apparently woke up when the data nerd call came out. Uh, but, uh, but one thing to note here, for those who've been here for five years or less, the share of undocumented who've been here for five years or less is about the same as the share of lawful permanent residents. What does that mean? It means that most, like more than we thought of in the past, the recent immigration is of lawful permanent residents. So again, sort of a slowdown in the migration flow. Another big change in the micro um, has to do with where people are from. Uh, if you ask people who came here 20 or 30 years ago, um, about half of them were from Mexico. Uh, this is an educated audience, but for most audiences, if I asked of you know of people who came in the last 10 years, what share are Mexican? A lot of people would say 150%, right? Sort of super Mexicans, right? Who uh, <laughs> really dominate the immigration laws. Um, only about a quarter of recent immigrants are from Mexico. And the rest, even not so much from Central America, which is what most people would think. People coming from China, India, the Philippines, Vietnam, then El Salvador, then Korea, then Guatemala, then Iran. So a much more diversified flow. So a lot of our old notions around the big demographic changes, uh, big demographic changes at an aggregate level, mostly Latino, mostly Mexican, some Central Americans, we need to kind of complicate that. The other thing that needs to be complicated um, is where uh, this demographic change is taking place. So in uh, 1980, uh, the darkest shade means greater than 50% people of color. Um, the dominant uh, border there was majority of people of color by census tract, which is basically a sort of neighborhood category. Um, you could see that 
it was where a lot of people kind of kind of thought South LA heading up the Alameda Corridor, the Greater East Side, a uh, little bit in the Valley. But when you move to uh, the year 2010, note a few things about this. First, demographic change has occurred south of the Orange Curtain, right? So in Orange County. Second, huge changes um, in the valleys, right? The San Gabriel Valley, big uh, Asian and Latino presence. Uh, Similarly, we're going to dive into South LA in just a second, which is a really important feeder community for you. Uh, and then you can see a uh, big demographic change in the San Fernando Valley, often thought of as the suburbia of Los Angeles. So now the very famous Valley girl is La Muchacha del Valle. Uh, <laughs> she, she is still shopping at the mall, but cumbia is on the buds, right? But she is less... So, uh, but what that, what that means, and I know uh, West LA has this uh, interesting catchment area because you're picking up from, uh, as I understand it, you're picking up, or you're picking up from anywhere, right? But it's a lot of people from the sort of west side of South LA, Culver City, Inglewood, Hawthorne. This, that's kind of the catchment area, is that correct? Yeah. So one of the things that uh, is interesting uh, about that is how much demographic change has occurred in those places, right? So. Uh, we can look at that a little bit by looking at uh, what's happened in South Los Angeles. Uh, this is from a project we did looking at South LA. South LA in 1970 uh, was about 80% African American and majority black in huge swaths of South Los Angeles. When you move to the year 2010, big change. We'll see where the big change occurred, but you can see that basically uh, the African American community in South LA is now mostly on the west side of South LA, sort of uh, a view park up, uh, Manchester Square down, uh, and in the unincorporated uh, county territories of uh, Willowbrook. Um, so, uh, what, where, what happened with the African American population? A couple of different things. Folks moved to Palmdale and Lancaster. Folks moved to uh, uh, the Inland Empire, and actually there was a lot of movement west to Inglewood, Hawthorne, and Lawndale. Uh, that movement was basically to get one school district away from the LA Unified School District, which was not doing well. Some of those school districts had their own kinds of challenges too, uh, but it was perceived as that being a better opportunity for folks. Uh, what was the big change? Uh, there was the growth in the Latino population, South LA is now two thirds uh, Latino, um, and what that in 1970 the Latino presence was basically a little bit of spillover from Huntington Park, and a little bit of spillover from the downtown area where those uh, sort of apartment buildings mix in with the garment uh, uh, industry. But when you move to 2010, it's really the entire uh, east side of South LA has become majority Latino. The most striking place is historic South Central. Well, everybody calls the, the whole big thing South Central Los Angeles, the lot you South LA too. Uh, the real South Central is where Central Avenue goes down and there's the Dunbar Hotel and the old jazz clubs and that kind of really famous history. That area is now about 95% uh, Latino. Um, so what do I, you know, so uh, underlying demographic change. Uh, so what, I mean, I think there's a couple of important things there then to think about with the students that you're getting. So first, I'm sure over the last bunch of years, your Latino presence of the student body has increased. Uh, second is within South Los Angeles, there's a sort of, a, we did a big report about this called Roots Raices, and one thing that we took a look at is that when the demographic change first started to happen, there were a lot of conflicts and tensions between African Americans and Latinos. That made the news. Uh, 20 years later, there's still some tensions, but there's a lot of daily accommodations, coalition building, etc. That doesn't make the news, because only conflict makes the news, right? 
So you see that I'm sure with your students too, uh, where I mean we did this project and was very what was kind of interesting about it was a uh, couple of couple of different things. First, uh, the Latinos that we I mean first a lot of the black uh, young people I mean obviously knew a lot of Latino folks right could speak a little bit of Spanish right kind of had a little bit of that in their head right and then for the Latinos who grew up in South LA which is interesting. Uh, they were, you know, we'd say, well, what's your, you know, what's your favorite music? And they go, I know I'm supposed to say mariachi. But I really love hip hop, right? Uh, so, and they they were very, and their icons were tended to be more African American than Latino you because know, they grew up in a kind of black space. So it's a really interesting thing that's going on. But the other thing that's going on, and I think it's something that people don't talk enough about, at least in honest terms, is there's a sense of loss because this was black space. And because there's a sense of loss, particularly with the Central Avenue corridor, now there's some hopes about how do you keep Crenshaw sort of it's got a, so it has a significant black presence and when we're park is celebrated, etc. But that sense of loss of space has a psychological impact on students as well, on whether or not they feel located uh, and whether or not they feel like their heritage is being left and their history is being lifted up. And we make a mistake if we don't talk honestly about that, that while that demographic change is simply going to occur, we need to create the bridges between communities, we need to understand the sense of loss that's going on, particularly because that's being coupled with a dramatic increase in housing prices, which I'll get to, which is forcing a lot of families out, and which creates a, a, another a sort of sense of loss, particularly for young people, whether or not they'll ever be able to move back. Um, so a couple of things about this, uh, the, our growth again is in young people, not in immigrants, but one interesting thing is our growth in young people is not actually as dramatic as it is in the rest of the United States, but there's a couple of other things about this that I want to lift up. So, but before I do, have I got you? Is this interesting so far? Yes, sir. Okay. So, a um, couple of things about this. Uh, demographic change that I think are important to pay uh, some degree of attention to. One is uh, the age structure. Uh, and that is, if you look at the age structure in California, and it's pretty much the same for the United States, the median age for uh, non-Hispanic whites is 45. Half older, half younger. The median age for Asian Pacific Islanders is 41. The median age, this is LA County, for African Americans is 38. The median age for Latinos is 29. So that's important for a couple of different reasons. So it helps to explain the ongoing demographic change because when you're 45, uh, uh, well, when you're 29, you're a prime family formation age. When you're 45, you think you're a prime family formation, right? So uh, you may be God uh, speaking, right? Uh, so it explains the demographic change. But there's also explains some of our political distance. You've got an older white generation looking at a younger generation that's much more diverse, not seeing itself, and not making the necessary investments in the infrastructure that allowed that older generation itself to succeed. And if you don't think that's the case, a couple of bits of data. So first, the state in the United States that's got the biggest racial generation gap, the whitest old and the brownest young, is Arizona. With its fractious politics around immigration, its fights around ethnic studies in the schools, and over the last eight years, the biggest cuts in K through 12 education per student of any state in the United States until this week when the teachers went out on strike and forced a 20% increase in their pay and some increase in spending on students as well. And if you look at this politically as well, one thing that's kind of interesting is uh, this is the racial generation gap for California, the red dots, and the racial generation gap for the United States. The racial generation gap, the percent of people above the age of 65 are white compared to the percent of people below the age of 18 
kids of color. It peaked in California between 1994 and 1998. The years of Prop 187, the elimination of bilingual education, the killing of uh, affirmative action, the passing of a three strikes law, the overcriminalization of black and brown youth, basically a set of racial propositions. And it's peaking right now in the United States with the election of Trump. It's projected to decline because it has, like in California, to some extent, for a number of different reasons, come to its senses. But as the demographic distance between the generations has shrunk, part of that has uh, changed as well. But it's in that era that we shortchanged community colleges. It's in that era that we shortchanged K through 12. It's in that era that we took our eyes off the kinds of public investments to make the economy grow in the future. One last bit of demographics, uh, which I think is actually uh, pretty important and underexplored, and I'll talk about a few other things. Um, this is uh, data on the following. If you're born in California, will you stay in California? So it looks at everybody in the census who was born in California, who's between the ages of 25 and 64, who lives in California. You can think about this as, I don't know, state loyalty or state sticking to it, right? Here's the interesting thing. Only 60% of non-Hispanic whites between 25 and 45 who are born in California are still in California. About 70% of African Americans, about 80% of Latinos, and Asian Pacific Islanders. That sticking to the state is much more prominent amongst people of color than it is amongst whites. That's actually a really interesting phenomenon. So this is not looking at folks who are white who moved into the state. This is when you were born in the state and you're still here. That's part of the reason why we will continue to have some demographic change going forward, even though our birth rates have slowed down for people of color, because these are the folks who stick to the state uh, a little bit more. So that's the demographic stuff. What's going on economically? And uh, I will be a little bit uh, quicker uh, about some of this stuff. Um, so the first thing to look at is what's happened to our economy in Los Angeles in particular. And one of the things about uh, LA that people kind of forget about is that we got clobbered in the early 1990s and we never really recovered. So the aerospace cutbacks <coughs> in the early 1990s when the Cold War ended kicked out the props of aerospace uh, and it wasn't just aerospace, it kind of dealt the final death blows to a bunch of other industries that were here as well. That had a significant impact in the Alameda Corridor and on African American workers. Had a significant impact here in West Los Angeles uh, because when aerospace got uh, knocked, it affected uh, the engineers who lived in Manhattan Beach, but it affected the sort of line workers who lived in Lawndale and Hawthorne, Lenox, and Inglewood. And that really resulted in a lot of demographic change. My wife is the superintendent of the Lawndale Elementary School District. And it's interesting because older people from Lawndale still think it's white. Like, that's a big mistake, right? Uh, so about 90% of their kids are free to reduce lunch. It's about 80, 85% Latino, about 10% African American which it wasn't in the past, but again, that sort of jump over from South LA. Um, so big demographic change uh, amongst the young. So we got our butts kicked in the 90s. We never really recovered. Uh, and partly as a result, uh, what we saw happen was very significant shifts in uh, wages that people get paid. So this takes a look at uh, folks who have a full-time year-round job. So some people don't, they get paid even more, so it's a full-time year-round job. It asks the question, what was the growth in wages at different points of the distribution of that between 1970, 
nine uh, in the current day. And you can see what's going on in the United States as a whole, right, which is the purple lines, I guess a little bit in homage of Prince. Uh, so you can see that for people at the top end of the wage distribution, their wages went up. For those in the middle, they went down. For those at the bottom end of the wage distribution, they really went down. But what you'll notice, the green bars are Los Angeles. Just like Los Angeles was America fast forward on demographic change, it's been America fast forward on economic inequality. That is, we've had a sharper drop in the bottom than in the rest of the United States. And the way, do you have a question? Yes. Um, when a lot of the factors on Al Qaeda left, do you think that that had a huge impact on, well, obviously, the economy, the demographics, and all the, a lot of the factories along the Alameda Corridor simply left, be they moved or relocated their factories to other countries or more inexpensive parts of the United States? Yeah, so that had a huge impact. Um, so, in a couple of different ways. Um, so, it basically, you know, working class people used to be able to attain middle class lifestyles. That is, if you had a good union job in one of those plants with a high school education or even less, you could make a down payment on the house. Uh, live someplace somewhat secure, uh, own a car, etc. When those jobs disappeared, that possibility disappeared uh, with it. Uh, had a huge impact, particularly on African Americans that were in those factories, uh, for a number of different reasons. The factories that were dominantly African American were the ones that got shut down first, and that had a that. Uh, that sort of economic loss occurred just as crack was making its way in to uh, an alternative economy, right? And so that then had this huge impact, at least in my view, we've done a lot of work looking at the history of making it even more difficult for working class and middle class people to want to stay in South Los Angeles because they felt like there's no jobs here, uh, there's the uh, the, the, the sweeping in of crack had two impacts. It militarized the gangs, even as the police themselves were being militarized. LAPD was the first police department in the country to own its own tank, um, which they used to batter down what they said were drug houses, but they tended to batter down like people's apartments and people go, what just happened here? Um, so that circumstance created a situation where, and I'm sure you know this from stories and folks, but uh, folks who would say, the way I always think about this, um, uh, our nation's, um, in my view, poet laureate and recent winner of the Pulitzer Prize, Kendrick Lamar, uh, <laughs> several albums ago, uh, Good Kid, Mad City, and the Good Kid, Mad City uh, song has a thing about being caught between the red and the blue. And being caught between the red and the blue meant being caught between the, the it's about the good kid, being caught between the crypts and the bloods, who you're supposed to be with. But then when he's trying not to do that, he's caught between the red and the blue of the police lights. Uh, and so for a lot of families, moving out of South LA was a way of taking their young men out of a very difficult circumstance. So those were ripple effects from that deindustrialization that I think can be tracked back. Does that make sense? It had a huge impact uh, on folks' lives. Um, jump over this. So, uh, turns out, oh, that, in that, in that getting into the detail, the important part of, part of what you pointed out is that uh, Los Angeles slipped as the Bay Area gained. So, one of the things, you know, in the past, Bay Area economy and the Los Angeles economy were sort of equally competitive. But over the last 25 years, with high tech, the Silicon Valley, et cetera, that economy's gone dramatically up, incomes up there have gone dramatically up, while incomes have actually fallen in Los Angeles County. So, 
there's huge uh, racial disparities that are part of this. Uh, this shows you uh, the percent of families falling below 150% of the poverty line. Uh, uh, much higher rates for black families uh, and Latino families than for white families. This might surprise some of you that there's higher rates for Asian Pacific Islanders. Anybody know why that is? So, one thing to understand about the Asian Pacific Islander community is that it's very bifurcated. There are some people with lots of education who are doing very well, and then there's a lot of folks from Southeast Asia and also from the Pacific Islands that are not doing very well at all. So one thing we also need to hold in our head when we think about student services is that there are a lot of low-income Asians as well who can tap into and need these kinds of services. Now, this is a very complicated chart, uh, but I'm actually going to take some time to explain it, and I'm going to start telling a lot of stories so as not to lose you to the data. Um, but this is worth understanding. So this is California in 1990, and it clumps people by whether they've got less than a high school diploma, they've got a high school diploma, but they haven't gone to college. They've gone to college, but they never got a degree. They managed to get an AA degree, or they managed to get a BA degree or higher. So first thing you'll notice, more education does what? Yeah, that's the uh, uh, in living color line. More money, more money, more money. So, more education, more money. The other thing you're going to notice is that for each and every level of education, there are racial disparities. Right? So even if you get educated, you're still going to see lower pay for African Americans, Latinos, and surprisingly for Asians. Given the level of education Asians have, they should be making a lot more money. So there's still discrimination in labor markets. Now, the thing I want you to pay attention to, this is 1990. Here's 2014. So first, for people with less than a high school degree, what happened to their income? For everyone. For people with only a high school degree, it went down. Let's look at people with a BA or higher, it went up. The only group that more or less held its own, a little bit of a shrinkage, the AA degree. The AA degree is incredibly important. It actually turns out to be the sort of great equalizer. And without getting into too much detail here, it's also the great, great equalizer here, right, in terms of racial disparities compared to some of the other uh, things. There's a lot of disparity for people who have a BA. Uh, because in the higher end of the labor market, there's still quite a bit of uh, racism slash racial assumptions about who's going to do well and who's not. Uh, but the AA degree is really important. Um, so I'm going to say one other thing about some of our challenges that I'm glad that you're uh, addressing, and then talk, uh, sort of bring this to a close with some, some more data and some more questions. The other a uh, big thing that's sort of affecting our uh, labor markets, well, should do this. One thing that's affecting you all right now is the following thing. This is the percent of kids by ethnic group who are in schools that are considered high poverty schools, meaning 75% of the kids are on free and reduced lunch. We know that if you go to a school that's a high poverty school, it's going to have less resources. It's often got teachers that have less experience. The infrastructure might be challenged. There's problems uh, when you've got these concentrations. <coughs> less than 10% of white kids in LA County are in high poverty schools. More than half 
of blind kids are in high poverty schools. More than two thirds, about two thirds of Latino kids are in high poverty schools. So when you think about the, uh, I mean, I forget to your name. Barrett. Barrett. Barrett was raising the sort of plethora of challenges that folks face. Uh, they're coming in. It's not just when they're here they've got those. They're coming in having had a whole concentration of challenges that other kids have not necessarily had. So that's in the data. The other thing, and I know the community college system has been uh, really instrumental in this, is that uh, partly as a result of all this fervor that led to the three strikes laws, and trying juveniles as adults, etc., California, while the rest of the country went on an incarceration craze, we went, and this is a technical term, hog ass crazy <laughs> on incarcerating. So while the rest of the country, the state prison population went up about threefold between 1978 and about 2008, our state prison population went up about sixfold. Um, by the year 2008, you would say, gosh, what happened? Maybe California got wise. California got sued because of overcrowding in the state prison population, started letting more people out. Our attitudes have changed. We passed Prop 47, which defelonized a lot of uh, drug use, allowed a lot of people to come out of the state prison system or clean up their records. But we have a huge legacy of the formerly incarcerated who need to lay back into the labor market we don't really have a lot of reentry programs. Community colleges are an important part of that. So, uh, a lot of that seemed like uh, bad news. Let me talk about uh, some good news that I think is important to be thinking about as we move forward. So, the first bit of good news has to do with some sort of rethinking that's going on. And I'll start by making it super concrete for all of you. So, you know, there's now this equity focus that you're supposed to have. Um, and in the past, when people talked about bringing an equity focus, it was mostly about fairness, justice, you know, something that like a lot of liberals would like. But I want to point out something. You and Chan, right, had an equity focus and you finally got the right amount of money. So what happened to the completion rates? They almost doubled. Right. Yeah. What happened to the transfer rates? Doubled. Uh, so what's that likely to do for the overall economy? generate economic growth. When you've got a situation in which you're leaving so many people behind, you're not actually able to grow the economy. And what people have, what economists have traditionally said in the past is that, you know, being fair is a nice thing to do, but you need some inequality because uh, people need to have some incentives, people need to have some savings, etc. What economists are increasingly discovering is the following thing. At an extreme, that's true. Like if you lived in the Soviet Union, and I went there once when it was the Soviet Union, there was not a lot of incentives, right? Like, you're not going to work very hard if it doesn't lead to any extra pay. But on the other hand, if you live in a place like the United States, which has gotten so unequal that you don't have sufficient consumer demand, you've locked so many people up in prison that you're wasting their talent, you've locked so many people out of the labor market because of their immigration status, You've got so many kids who you're underserving, etc. You're actually hurting economic growth. So one of the things that I think is really important is that there's been a shift uh, in economic thinking. Part of it's in a book that we did, where pursuing equity is actually uh, good for the economy and not just good for your sense of well-being or. 
feeling good about people. Does that make sense? And I think that that's extraordinarily important because we've tended to make arguments about addressing these things on fairness. And I'm not saying don't be fair or moral or just. I'm saying claim the economic high ground as well as the moral high ground. Because we know, we estimate it, that if we closed the racial gaps in Los Angeles County in terms of income, meaning we made sure that employment levels were similar and people were paid the same, we would add about $400 billion to the LA County economy. That's good for the economy. The other things that I think have emerged that are sort of new and perhaps useful to you is some new thinking about how to think about equity. Um, and some of this comes out of some projects we've been uh, working on. And it's uh, about the following. The last point of this is that the most important. So first thing is that we've often in the past thought about equity as treating everybody the same. That's not equity. Because people are arriving with very different circumstances. The kid who is in a has been through a lot of foster families and is now living on their own has a very different set of resources than the person who's still in a two-parent family. The person who's worried about whether their parents are going to be deported has a very different level of stress than the person who doesn't have any concern. The young African American who's worried that they'll be uh, stopped by the police or booted out of the Starbucks for trying to start a business has a very different set of things going on for them. So equity doesn't mean uh, equality. It means giving people what they need to be able to succeed. And that can mean targeting resources. Um, the second thing about equity is that if that first thing is true, it means that you need different programs for different people. So having an uh, honest conversation about differences in terms of race, what are the primary obstacles for black students versus what are the primary obstacles for Latino students, that's not a conversation meant to divide. It's meant to illuminate so that you can actually figure out what to do. The third thing I would say about equity that is coming out that's new is that we tend to think about equity as repairing past damage. Like there's these legacies of uh, Jim Crow and slavery or immigration, big issues, but even more congruently, what kind of schools did you come from, etc. But it's also got two other aspects in terms of time. One is what's going on now and whether or not people are really engaged, including the students in a discussion about equity with me on a campus. But it's also about the future and trying to figure out if what you're doing now could actually help things or worsen things in the future. So I'm just going to give you an example from not your field and then we'll figured out for community colleges. But there's, you know, we're very happy right now that, uh, I don't know whether you're happy right now, but I'm happy right now that Los Angeles has decided to once again invest in mass transit. Because I think it's like totally cool to be able to take the train out to Santa Monica or, you know, come to Pasadena. It's just great. Uh, on the other hand, that investment in mass transit is getting a lot of people to come to neighborhoods they never came to before. And one thing that's going on in particular in South Los Angeles, so those of you who know South LA, 
probably do the police because you work here or you grew up or support, whatever. Here's the interesting thing about South LA. If you drive down the major boulevards, with the exception of some, particularly now that some transit's coming in, you, you get the crunch out, you, you look and you go, man, it's really underinvested. And then you go off like three blocks into the housing and you look at the pride of place and how nice that housing is and what good housing fabric it is. And what you realize is that as soon as somebody invests in those boulevards, people are going to walk into the neighborhoods and go, oh, let's buy that stuff. So it's not that you don't want to get the public investment into the boulevards, but you want to make sure that you're not forcing people out. So how do you make sure that something you're doing that's good doesn't result in inequity in the future? Yes, ma'am. In certain parts over there, like you referenced Crenshaw, you're actually seeing the reverse. People are coming in or passing through and like, oh, these homes are nice. Now they're buying the homes. Yes. And especially with a lot of elderly black people, if they have to sell, um, it's pricing other people out. I know I have a few friends who said they can't even buy in the neighborhood they grew up in. That is absolutely true, and one of the things we've been talking about, I know the city's trying to talk about, is to how can you create uh, loan programs so kids can buy their parents' houses? Because part of what's going on is the parents are older, they deserve to cash out um, and move someplace else, and the home is too big, etc. but their kids have no way to get in. And so you're absolutely right, that's, that's a phenomenon that's going on. More of it's going to go on unless we think ahead. So what I, what I mean is that equity also means thinking ahead, not just so what is it that you're doing now that might cause problems in the future, and how do you need to address that? A uh, couple of other things. We think that data is very important. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, what that means moving forward. So <coughs> first thing. If California is America fast forward in terms of demography, if California was America fast forward in terms of the economy, if California has become, in an important sense, a state of resistance to what's going on nationally, what we do in California is absolutely critical. So that means that getting things right, like our community college system, is really important. And the community college system is important for another set of reasons. This is the last graph I'll show. So for those of you who don't like graphs, uh, your moment of relief has come. For those of you who do like graphs, we can have a secret party later. <laughs> but this is my favorite graph, and not simply because it's animated. This looks at, comes back to the demography. And ask the question, uh, what's the size of the population that's young versus the size of the population that's old? And demographers usually talk about a demographic pyramid, lots of young people, less people in the middle. Of course, as you get to the older ages, there are less and less of us for reasons that we know as we meet our bank. And in the year 1950, the U.S. had a demographic pyramid. Lots of people at the bottom, less in the middle, health care wasn't that good, a lot less people as you got older. But as you move from 1950 to the year 2060, we're moving to a demographic cylinder. Less young people being born less immigrants filling in the middle of the labor market, and more of us living to an older age. That means the following thing. How many of you have children? And how many of you want to make sure that your children do better than you? How many of you have sort of bad intentions and want your children to do worse than you? <laughs> just, just, just to kind of teach them a lesson, right? So. <laughs> So almost all of us want our children to do better than us. You better hope they do 60% better than you. 
because the so-called dependency ratio, the ratio of older people on Medicare and Social Security that need to be supported by people in the working population is projected to rise by 60%, first in California, then in the nation. So if we want a functioning economy going forward, these educational systems and what they do and how they equip people to grow the economy is absolutely critical. So to me, it means that we need to stress that equity and inclusion are fundamental. We need to stress the role of the community colleges. We need to think about community college students not simply as the recipients of the system, but as the agents of change. I don't know how much you all are doing with this, but at Downs a College in Northern California, they actually have a social justice program, and they're teaching kids community organizing, because they know that they're going to need to do that to help support the community colleges in the future with activism, in order to address a lot of the issues that they face as well. Um, but we need to uh, think about what we want to do moving forward. It's really, really critical what you're doing here, both because California needs to show the path for the nation and uh, because uh, the idea of not simply now knowing that equity is central to growth, talking about equity is key but developing indicator projects that track how we're doing and hold us accountable, absolutely critical. So very much pleased to be with you. I think it's going to be challenging as we move ahead, but we'll be able to move ahead together. And if you want to know more about this, you should buy my book. <laughs> or you should ask Angel to buy a copy for everyone. So it's a really good community college investment. Uh, I will brag about this for just a second. This book came out on April 3rd, last Sunday. It was featured on the front page of the New York Times Review of Books, which if anybody knows the book world, that is a drop-the-mic moment. <laughs> uh, and it's really pumped up to sales. So with that, let me conclude, and then I've got an exercise to run you through. So, thank you. Thank you.